This is Zach Yacoub from How to Get a Job in Sports.com, and I'm here with Keith Law, writer at The Athletic and baseball author. How are you? I'm good, thanks. How are you? I'm doing great. So you went to Harvard University and Carnegie Mellon University. What were your majors? What did you learn that you still use today? So undergrad was Harvard. I had a joint major in sociology and economics. Um, I probably make more use of the economics material and the stats classes I was required to take uh, than anything else. Um, I took some other classes that were fun. I took some language classes. I took Italian because I'd wanted to learn it for a while because that's my heritage. I actually took a calculus class, even though I wasn't required to, because I just like that stuff. Um, and certainly there's like an analytical way of thinking, like just the idea of approaching problems and from that mindset has come up kind of throughout my work life afterwards. Then I worked for a couple of years, did a stint as a management consultant, which was miserable. Um, it pays okay, but the job stinks, at least for me. And then went and got an MBA, um, business degree at Carnegie Mellon, where because they're on a quarter system, it was two years like most business school programs, but we took a ton of classes. You'd have seven weeks and finals, seven weeks and finals repeatedly. Uh, so it was pretty intensive. Uh, once again, took uh, more than essentially the equivalent of more than a year's worth of statistics, extremely useful class on machine learning, uh, which turned out to be really useful. I didn't know it at the time. I just thought it was fun. Uh, but now that's how a lot of major league teams are dealing with all of the data that they're getting from major league baseball and from third parties is using machine learning techniques. Sometimes it's called artificial intelligence or AI. That's not really the best term. Machine learning is a better way to describe what that does. Um, and, you know, accounting and finance classes that I don't use directly and probably never really have, but it's, I think, extremely valuable to understand that language. Oddly enough, the worst class I took there was a macroeconomics class taught by an eventual Nobel Prize winner who was indecipherable. I mean, I was not the only one. Most of us, I think a third of us ended up dropping out of the class entirely and taking something else to fulfill the requirement because... He just nobody could understand what this guy was trying to teach. It's probably the only time in my life I've had that experience where I was sat in a class and said, I have no idea what's going on here. I was really questioning my sanity, right? I did fairly well in school. How have I run into this situation where, and by the way, I studied economics before I'd taken a macroeconomics class in college because I had to for my major. And then I get there and it's like, this guy is speaking gibberish. Had no idea what he was talking about. Saw the test, got one test and said, I don't know what any of this is. Went right to the office. It was a parade of us after that saying, out, out. We'll take another class to fulfill the requirement. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes uh, even if someone's really knowledgeable in their field, they're not able to, you know, communicate it the right way for sure. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, yeah that's a huge part of it. Yeah. So Harvard, Carnegie Mellon, did you cover, you know, their sports teams in any way? Did you write a little bit about them? Never. That's... Uh, one of the peculiar things about my career is I wrote some music and arts related stuff for a newspaper, weekly newspaper at college. And that was it. That was my only actual writing experience uh, before starting as a freelancer for baseball prospectus around 1995, 96 or so. And I say freelancer because it's all it was. It was a website and an annual book and everybody had jobs. We were all just doing this stuff on the side because we liked it and did that and eventually did some f mostly fantasy baseball writing for ESPN, started doing some business of baseball stuff at the very tail end um, for more for baseball perspectives, but a little bit of that for ESPN also. Um, and then uh, went to, got this you know, serendipitous opportunity uh, uh -huh. to go work for the Toronto Blue Jays at the very tail end of 2001. And, um, you know, I was very lucky more than anything else. Just I was the right person, the right place at the right time and got that job, worked in the front office there for four and a half years, but discovered I missed writing. I missed having an outlet for writing. Um, and so I, uh, when I just decided that front office thing wasn't for me, I wasn't really happy with the, either the, the job itself um, the content of the job itself, the lack of control I had over my schedule. I was about to become a father at that point and uh, reached out to someone at ESPN and said, what opportunities might you have? They, they were looking for somebody to fill the position that I ultimately filled, which was kind of their scouting baseball writer and was there for 13 years before I left at the end of last year to go to The Athletic. That's great. 
So yeah, no, that is absolutely crazy. As, as accomplished of a writer you are in baseball that you didn't write, you know, for Harvard and Carnegie Mellon. That's pretty funny how your path is, you know. Yeah, I never planned to become a writer. If you go back and look at stuff I wrote as a kid, you know, about what do you want to be when you grow up, I don't think I ever said a writer. And now I can't imagine doing anything else. Like I could, I could imagine writing about other things um, or working for other places, but I can't imagine not being a writer. As, as that has to whatever I do in life, that would have to be a big part of it. That's great. So you ran through us, you know, your time with the Blue Jays, which was being a consultant to baseball operations, how you started off, then you ended up being able to be the special assistant to the general manager. You know, you moved from there to ESPN, as you said, but what skills did you pick up in uh, Toronto that carried over, even though it wasn't the same type of job? Well, so what they were looking for at ESPN specifically was somebody who had front office experience and had spent a little time scouting. Um, I was stronger on the front office side because I was kind of their whole analytics department at the time. But I had uh, I spent a lot of time with the scouts there. Um, some in particular, actually just spoke to one again this morning. We're, we're still friends. We still stay in touch. A lot of them are still in the industry. Um, many of them have scattered to the four winds, but a few of them are still actually with Toronto. And I followed them around and asked a lot of questions and tried to learn because uh, I thought that was information that we needed to do better, whatever we were doing, the draft, trades, my early free agents, rule five, any of that, trying to just rely as heavily as we were on statistical, statistical information, especially what was available back then, which was pretty limited, was not doing it. And also it didn't do enough to differentiate us from other teams. There were teams that basically were all scouting and there were teams that were mostly, maybe not all, but mostly analytics. And we were in the second camp and we did okay, I think, until a few other teams started doing the same thing. And then I realized we were all going after the same very small pool of players. And that was pointless. We got to the fourth or fifth round one year and I looked up at the draft board, turned to my colleague and said, I don't really like any of the players who are left here. We just cut off so many guys for various performance related reasons or statistical reasons that we hadn't opened ourselves up enough to finding players who may have, who, who would end up having success. We just cut off half of the draft pool and said, um, no, we can do this just with this one little tool essentially it was like having a sieve right you pass all the players through the sieve but only half of them get through to the next level and suddenly you realize you're out of players and other teams are still drafting still finding guys they like but who might be riskier more raw require more development we just we weren't we weren't interested in that and so I took it upon myself to try to learn the scouting side you know then the approach for the team didn't change and I didn't think we were really headed in the right direction and so I left uh, the team actually did do fine for a couple of years after that. Then they had a GM, you know, a little setback, had a GM change, and then they were really successful with Alex Anthopoulos, who succeeded the guy who was my boss as the GM in Toronto. That's great. So, you know, with ESPN, you know, you do these, like, a lot of things related to scouting, you know, ranking players, you know, mock drafts, as you said. When you are writing these, are you generally just interested as a baseball fan in your findings? Like, what, Yeah. Yes. Yes. I go, I like what I do because I like going to see players. I like evaluating players. I like thinking about them and what's good and what's not good. And what do I think this player is going to become? And obviously people pay to read my opinions and I take something from that. I feel an obligation. People have paid to read my writing. And so I need to think about this as thoroughly as possible and gather all the information that I can and uh, translate that into something that anybody can read. I use some scour scouting jargon because I think sometimes it's just useful. They're the sort of the most direct ways to express certain things. But I also try to keep in mind that this is not written for scouts or even for club executives, although they read it, but it's written for everyone. And ultimately I want to be able to, I want readers to be able to say, okay, I think I understand why Keith likes this player or why he thinks this player is going to be a star and thinks this player is going to have trouble um, remaining a starting pitcher in the big leagues, for example. There's a lot of those types of things where it's, you know, it's binary. Is he a star? Is he not a star? Is he a starter or a reliever? Can he stay at shortstop? I am wrong on some of those sometimes. It's simply nature of the job. But I do try to uh, give readers all the information I can so they understand where my opinion is coming from. And if they want to disagree, I've at least given them the basis for my opinion so they can look and say, okay, well, it's not just that I think he's a starter and you're wrong. It's like, well... Keith, you said you don't like where his elbow is when his front leg lands. 
and think that makes him a reliever. We hear some counterexamples why I think that doesn't matter. We hear reasons why other things he does mechanically in his delivery that mean that that don't that thing won't matter so much. So to me, that's the mark of a good writer is when not only has he given you his or her argument, but they've also given you the underlying evidence or the justification for the argument so that you have the opportunity to say, I agree with this much, but maybe not with this other thing. And here's where I stand instead. That's great. So you just gave an example of some way, you know, you'd rank a player, where's the elbow is when he lands, what are some other things, you know, you look for, you know, in a player as a, as a scout? So. so I think the biggest thing for, um, you know, when it comes to mechanics, you know, there are other things, but just to continue with this idea of mechanics is the biggest thing is, can the player just repeat it? Can he do it over and over again consistently so that it looks pretty much the same every time? If you're a pitcher and you can do that, you've got a much better chance to throw strikes. If you're a hitter and you can do that, you've got a much better chance to control the bat and be able to hit pitches when they're thrown sort of all over the strike zone, even maybe occasionally a little bit out of the strike zone. There are guys with bad hitting or pitching mechanics who've had success anyway, but I know the way I'd like to bet. I bet on the guys who are pretty sound mechanically and able to repeat the things they do. I also look for athleticism. Uh, you can't teach a kid to be a good athlete. You can teach a lot of kids to be better baseball players, but you can't teach them to be better athletes. Um, and I like players who have good instincts. And there's a lot of ways to talk about that. And a lot of them are nonsense. I have said often, I think sometimes people refer to intangibles or chemistry, and it's actually kind of a coded way to introduce race into the equation, which you know should never be part of a discussion of a baseball player's merits. But of course it is because this is the real world and baseball has a long history of racism inside and around the industry. But I do try to pay attention for things on the field, makeup or character, things on the field that I think very specifically translate to production, like a fielder who manages to always get himself into the right position or who has a really quick first step because he's reading the pitch or the situation particularly well, or a pitcher who just seems to have a really good idea of when to use certain pitches in, in what counts. They're hard to, dis to, hard to measure. I think they're easy to describe, they're hard to define but I try to look for them. I've just seen so many games over the years. I think I know what I'm looking for. And those are things I do try to include in a scouting report. Now, you could have the greatest instincts in the world, but if you're built like me, you're not going to have a big league career. If you have great instincts in your maybe 5'10 and 180, which is small in baseball terms, but not unplayably small, you might have a better chance than the 5'10, 180 kid or the 6'200 kid who doesn't have the same understanding or feel for the game. That's great. So you obviously have, you know, a vast understanding of baseball mechanics, statistics, you know, everything about the game of baseball. Did you just learn this as being an avid fan or is that, is that where it came from? So uh, different answers to different parts. Anything I know about scouting, uh, traditional scouting, including stuff about mechanics, largely came from me asking scouts and executives and just talking over now an 18 year career uh, between the Blue Jays, ESPN, The Athletic of going out to games, seeing players, writing about players, talking to people about players. I like this and I understand this. What do you think about that? And you just have to be willing to go into anything like that with a lot of humility. Maybe not exactly my strongest suit, but I do sort of regularly acknowledge I'm not actually a scout. Right? I'm a writer who scouts, but I am not a scout. And I very seriously uh, take the opinions of scouts. I think even if I don't actually agree with them, I want to know what they think. I trust their eyes. Even though we may ultimately disagree on a player, they will nearly always say something to me um, that reveals something about the player maybe I didn't think about or maybe I had thought about and I'll give it more or less weight depending on what that scout says to me. I have met some scouts who I, you know, who were just so vague in their descriptions of players that I'd say, well, this guy's maybe a good scout, but he's not useful to me. I can't learn from him. I can't take his thoughts and put them somehow into my writing because he's so nonspecific about that. I am, I like specifics. I like evidence. I like to try to think of this as a you know, question. You've asked me a question. What do you think of Spencer Torkelson, who might be the first pick in the draft in a month? Uh, you know, I can tell you about Spencer Torkelson and I can break him down somewhat specifically with some specifics about his swing or about his game and, you know, what kind of fielder he is and what his eye is like and what kind of runner he is. That to me is is a far more useful way to talk about players than sort of the cliche ridden method that some scouts use and it may work for them. It just doesn't work for me specifically. On the stat side, I started out, like I said, writing for baseball prospectus. 
we've continued to read uh, the work of many other writers over the years, even though I don't do any kind of direct stat work myself, but I, I follow and stay in touch with guys like Dan Simborski, or Russell Carlton, who even spent a year working for the Mets. Um, there's a lot of people out there doing really good work and uh, on sites like Fangraphs mm-hmm. and uh, Baseball Prospectus. And now we have some at The Athletic too. And I just try to, can't read them all, but I try to keep up with it. Um, and I should mention too, Russell Cartland a couple of years ago had a great book called The Shift, which I thought was really excellent. And it's funny, it came out maybe a year after my first book, Smart Baseball. And when people would read Smart Baseball and say, that was great. I want to read something else like it. I'd say, I have a book for you. It's called The Shift. And oddly enough, we, I think we came at things from a pretty similar mindset, but we didn't cover a lot of the same specific topics, maybe one or two total. So the books do really work very well, sort of one, two or two, one to, if, if you want to, Take an analytical way of thinking without getting too much in the weeds where you're actually like, you have to know how to use a database. You, you don't have to do that to read either of these books. That's great. Yeah, I'll definitely jot that down. I, I loved your book, Smart Baseball. Let me Thank just you. Full title here. It's the story behind the old stats that are ruining the game, the new stats that are running it, and the right way to think about baseball. I read it two years ago. I'm a huge fan of the analytics of the game. You know, I'm really interested in you know, these new stats. And I, I want to get you, I want to, before we talk about the book, I actually want to ask you a question. What mm-hmm. do you think is the most important or the best defensive metric to measure a player's skill? Is it errors, fielding percentage? What do you think? There is, for outfielders at least, we now have on MLB's site, outs above average, and that gets the highest marks. Third parties who've looked at all of the available stats um, consistently say that's the best, and it's particularly the most predictive because often when we look at a fielding stat, we look at any stat, you're, you're generally trying to answer one of two questions. How good was he? So if you're like trying to figure out who belongs on an all-star team or who should be the MVP, well, how good was he? Or the other question is how good is he going to be in the future, next year, the next three years, the next five years, maybe he's a free agent, or maybe you're just trying to pick someone for your fantasy team. Um, fielding percentage and errors, uh, which are just two sides of the same coin, they fail both tests. They exclude so much data from the first one, essentially any play that you should have made, but you didn't get to doesn't count. So those are useless, but they also don't have any predictive value, probably because they omit so much data. Outs above average seems to be the best at both of those things. For infielders, we have less. Uh, I still look at ultimate zone rating, which you can find on Fangraphs, and defensive run save DRS, which you can find on Fangraphs or baseball reference. Try to look at both because I think neither is perfect. I speak to folks with teams in front offices who think they have defensive metrics because they use they have access to all the Statcast data. They think they have metrics that are better, that are significantly better, so that they can judge infield defense much more accurately. We don't have that. So when someone in a front office wants to tell me, "Oh, do we think this guy saved 20 runs this year for us at shortstop?" I listen. I don't doubt them. I guess they could be lying to me, but I, probably a little trusting. Um, but the, we don't have anything public that is that accurate. And certainly not for infielders that's as good as outs above averages for outfielders. That's great. You know, I definitely agree with your statement there about how errors, you know, aren't an accurate representation. I mean, Trey Turner, I mean, that guy's range is unbelievable, but he makes, you know, a good amount of, I mean, it's a normal amount of errors, nothing special, but like they, what, what fielding percentage doesn't count is, you know, all the plays he's able to get to that. Right. Know. Well, this was, there's a player who you probably won't remember he's a little before your time named Jose Valentin. And he always made a lot of errors at shortstop. And so a lot of people, broadcasters, media people, and even some front office people thought he was a bad defender. And people who were writing for baseball prospectus, especially at the time, Gary Huckabee always said this. Uh, I think Christina Carl was also on the, on the Jose Valentin bandwagon saying, no, no, no. He gets to far more balls hit into his area of responsibility, even some that are not than other shortstops do. So don't penalize this guy because he fielded a ground ball that probably should have been fielded by the second baseman or fielded by nobody because he was going to go into the outfield. He got to that. Now, sometimes he gets to that and makes an out. Sometimes he gets to that and makes an error. But acknowledge that that is a skill. That's something we generally want. We want guys with a lot of range. As long as they can you know, understand, have some understanding of what balls in play they shouldn't try to field or you know, recognize their limitations. But if they can get to... 10, 15 more balls in play per year and convert even half of those into outs, those were probably all going to be hits if they didn't get to them. And so there was value in that player that, especially at the time, this is before UZR, DRS, or anything of the sort, people just didn't recognize that guy was good. Turned out he was actually good, but his reputation in and around the game was more like he was bad because he made a lot of errors. 
Yeah, that's great. The reason I bring that up is because I'm a huge Nats fan. Anthony Rendon is obviously a guy I watch on a daily basis, and he makes amazing plays. And then mm-hmm. I see these defensive stats, and they're like average, average, average. And I'm just, I was just so confused. I wonder if they were accurate. Yeah. That's interesting. I haven't looked at his specifically. I would always visually have graded him out as an above average defender. He's probably, he was probably a plus defender when I saw him in college. Um, he had great first stat pretty really accurate arm just good hands too that's a tough thing to measure um i'm sure there are some advanced stats that do better with this too because you can check like you know the velocity of ground balls hit to a player and how well did he handle harder hit balls for example but he has always struck me as a guy who had very easy and very sure hands so if he had to bare hand a ball for example or, or had a hard line drive or hard ground ball hit to him he had the kind of hands that he could field that cleanly and have the chance at least to make the throw and convert it into an out absolutely going back into your book uh smart baseball you know tell me what inspired you to write it and how the writing process was for you so that was my first book came out 2017 and that was very much in response to readers for years asking is there a primer a you know book i could read that would help me understand some of these stats you're talking about people who would often say look i understand why you say rbi are not useful as a way to measure a hitter sort of but I'd like to read more about that and then understand what stats should I look at instead. And for a while I'd resisted the idea of writing a book, not because I didn't want to do it, but I didn't think I could do it well. It always said I didn't want to write a book I wouldn't want to read because I would have publishers come to me and know that I had an audience and say, hey, write this little coffee table, you know, throwaway book. And it was, no, nah, it's not. It's not me. Books are a lot of work. They take a lot of work to write. Um, and so it wasn't until I had an idea that I was kind of enthusiastic about and I thought I could do this. I can explain some more difficult concepts and make them easier. Um, it's just something I've always tried to do in writing. People have told me they think I do it well. And also it gave me a chance to try to be funny. Like my writing generally for other sites online um, or even for my main site, whether you're ESPN or The Athletic, I try to be humorous. And I thought the way I wanted to go in smart baseball, I could potentially do that. And in both my books, uh, including the inside game, which just came out a couple weeks ago, same thing. Like my voice is in there. That's my hope is that my voice is in there a lot more. And actually a couple of very close friends have come to me and said in this book, they think it's even more evident. The first book I may have been so focused on teaching and making things clear. Some friends came back and said, it's not as funny as you are. And I was, oh, okay. Well, maybe I should be better this time. Hope that people seem to think this book is funnier, which is odd just because I would have guessed it would be the other way around. This book, I was so nervous about what I was writing that I felt like I had less time to worry about being funny. The first book I was like, yeah, I know this. I know where I'm going. I thought I was funnier, but who knows? Maybe it was the pressure made me end up being in, in, inserting more humor into this book. <laughs> well, I haven't read the second book yet, but I can tell you the That's first good. book is very insightful and funny. So I'm, I'm assuming the same from the second. So mm-hmm. talk a little bit more about the second. What inspired you to you know, write the second book? So the second book, The Inside Game, Bad Calls, Strange Moves, and What Baseball Behavior Teaches Us About Ourselves uh, came from talking to front office executives who were reading a lot of books about behavioral economics or cognitive psychology, about how we think and how people aren't always rational. Um, If anyone's taken an economics class uh, who's watching this, you know classical economics just assumes people are rational. They'll do what's in their best interests. That's definitely not true. You can see it's not true right now, actually, in the middle of this pandemic. Uh, where people are clamoring to reopen businesses, even though the scientific evidence says this is a really bad idea. And a lot of the concepts actually that you could use to evaluate what's happening right now in this political discussion, I discuss them in the book, but I discuss them in baseball contexts. So I use some of these cognitive biases or errors to talk about baseball decisions that went wrong and that were probably bad decisions in the first place. The other way is if if you don't care about any of this stuff, you don't want to learn what anchoring bias is or what moral hazard is. You just read this as a baseball book and say, well, Keith's going to tell some fun baseball stories and maybe just look at it through a different lens than anyone has before. So I felt like it could work both ways. You could really read this as a baseball book, uh, which is what a lot of my readers expect, but you could also look at this as kind of a baseball, uh, sorry, as a business book, as a way to make yourself, or even like a little bit of a pop psychology book where just make yourself a better thinker. So you recognize these biases when they happen to you, and whether it's at work or in personal finance or somewhere else, you can make better choices because you'll catch yourself making this mistake, because we all do, if you're human, you will fall for these cognitive traps, and then change your process so that you can overcome it and maybe make a better decision in the end. Great. Yeah, sounds like an awesome book. So tell me about what the qualities are of a good writer. So the biggest piece of advice I always give to writers, young writers or would-be writers, you cannot be a great writer unless you are a great reader. 
I read typically about 100 books a year. I'm not going to do that this year because the pandemic has wrecked me in terms of reading. It's weird, but because everyone's home, I don't have as much quiet time. I'm also not on planes. It turns out I did a lot of reading on airplanes. Um, so, you know, the struggle is real, right? This is not an actual problem, but it's just dented my reading a little bit. But typically, I read a lot. I mean, read a lot of different genres, and I read a lot of different authors. I actually read mostly fiction, but I mix in a lot of nonfiction. Uh, and I... Uh, I read for fun. I read because it's almost meditative for me, but I also know that I am always picking up things from the prose, typically. If someone's a good writer, and I know it, I'll know it almost immediately. If someone's a good writer, if someone's a bad writer, I'll know it immediately because then I can't stand reading it. Um, sometimes I finish anyway because I'm a stubborn ass like that, but not always. Um, sometimes I will just actually put a book down because this person can't write. Um, but I'm not actively looking to borrow phrases necessarily or borrow expressions, but I think everything I read that I like makes its way into my writing somehow. Like the voice that I have as a writer is very much the product of the thousand plus books I've read in my lifetime. Um, and I say that is a good thing. And I think you, you know, it's, it'll help you. Reading a lot will help you find your voice. So will writing, of course, but not everybody can write. Not everybody has opportunities to write and write for an audience or write for an editor or maybe more than just a teacher. Like you really, writing is great. It's great practice. Um, a lot of writers will talk about how they wrote journals when they were kids. And I think it's great. I was not one of them. But I would never, ever discourage someone from doing that. I think just putting pen to paper is a very useful thing to do to try to develop your own voice, but you need, I think, the feedback of something, an audience, family, friends, multiple teachers, more than just one or two people seeing your writing to respond to it and hopefully help you refine it. And I will say that the final thing I'll say in answer to this question is that um, you, writing is a craft at which you will improve with practice, like anything else. And I'm sure I was not anywhere near the writer in 2000 than I am today. I have written, God, I've got I've written a million words between then and now, between all my ESPN and athletic content and two books. I've written a lot and a lot of other freelance stuff for other sites. I just write a lot. And there's no question I feel more confident writing now. I can sit down and map out an article or a column in my head before I write. It wasn't always like that. It was absolutely not always like that. And there are some writers who will write for 20 years and tell you they still have to outline everything. That's not bad. But I got out of that because I felt confident enough in my craft and knew my own voice and my uh, style of arguing that I felt I still feel like I can usually just sit down and start writing and see myself through to the end. That's great. So, you know, you talked about, you know, it was a long journey, you know, to be able to write, you know, two books. I'm sure the first book was probably even, you know, much harder because you have to navigate all the different new things to you. Mm -hmm. um, what is the most unexpected thing that came out of writing a book? Um, oh, that's a good question. Um, I mean, I've certainly gotten responses, positive responses from people even outside of the baseball world or outside of my normal circles who've come out and said really positive things, which is extremely rewarding. When George Will wrote a positive review of Smart Baseball in the Washington Post, um, George Will has written about baseball, but he's better known as a political writer. But when he wrote a really, really kind and positive review. First of all, it like, helped sales directly because he's George Will. Yeah. Uh, but also, it was just, I was unbelievably flattered. Like, this extremely intelligent and erudite writer liked my work. And, you know, I thought the book would be well received because my editor liked it. And all the people at HarperCollins said, no, it's a good, this is good. We like this. And, and my friends liked it. But because of course they did. But when people I didn't know came back with that kind of feedback or people within the industry who I only knew a little bit um, would come up to me and say, I really liked your book. That just turned out to mean a lot more to me than I ever expected it would. I didn't think I'd get that feedback. And then when it came, it was, wow, this is incredibly rewarding. And I say I wrote the book because I got paid to write the book. Like that's, you know, you, you, I write for food. <laughs> but getting that kind of feedback was extremely rewarding and definitely, and also really helped me decide to do it again, because knowing how much effort went into writing the first one and choosing a topic that was more challenging and less in my direct area of work or knowledge um, made it more forbidding. And, but remembering how positive the process was after the first, first book came out, that really helped me um, push through, helped me propose the second book and then helped me push through when I got 
into the weeds and felt, you know, I can't do this. I'm not qualified. What am I thinking? All the imposter syndrome stuff that I think a lot of people suffer, but that particularly hit me badly with the second book. That's great. So you've talked about, you know, you read a ton of books. I'm sure you've read thousands and thousands of books in your lifetime. Who, what author, you know, has stuck out to you? What has been some important authors maybe inspired you to write your first book or you model your work after? Uh, like I said, the, the, I actually read far more fiction than nonfiction. My two books were obviously both nonfiction, but just for pl reading for pleasure, especially. I love P.G. Woodhouse. I love Rex Stout, who wrote the Nero Wolf Mysteries. I have read something like 50-something Agatha Christie novels. I read everything Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh ever published. Uh, two great like classical mid-20th century British authors with a sort of weirdly Catholic bent to both of their writing. I'm not a practicing Catholic, but there was just something about their prose that always really spoke to me. Um, Richard Russo is a more contemporary fiction writer whose work I've always just really enjoyed. Or Jasper Ford with two Fs, who's an English writer who's written a bunch of fantastical uh, science fiction-y kind of novels. They're very funny and very irreverent. And again, styles that just all really spoke to me. And a lot of those writers are, uh, are very funny in their own different ways. Other than Agatha Christie, I think everybody I mentioned, there's some significant humor in their writing. Um, it's funny for nonfiction, I've read lots of books. I do a lot of nonfiction books on audio, especially you know, when I have long, long scouting trips too. But I tend to bounce around a lot more. I'm less loyal maybe to specific authors on the nonfiction side where I'll look and say, oh, maybe you know, this won the Pulitzer for nonfiction this year. A couple of years ago it was The Sixth Extinction by Elizabeth Colbert, I think was her name with a K. That was amazing. Um, and not the happiest read because uh, it's about climate change and how we're wiping out so much of the biodiversity on the planet, but it was exceptionally well done, really well told. And I think the next year the winner was evicted um, about uh, an economist who went and stayed uh, in Milwaukee in the kind of inner city with people who were constantly on the verge of losing their apartments and getting evicted and following how bad that process was. And once you get caught in the eviction spiral, how difficult it is financially for people to get out. And once you're evicted the first time, because of legal fees or difficulty storing your stuff, getting security together or being allowed even to rent another apartment because you've been evicted before, these people get caught in a really terrible economic spiral. Um, these were great and they're really well researched. That was the one thing that I think a lot of those books, those nonfiction books that I've enjoyed, they tend to be really well researched, well thought out um, that, um, you know, and that encouraged me in this book. Like my second book has a lot of footnotes. Um, and I was very careful to spend a lot of time reading academic literature to make sure I kind of knew what I was talking about. Because I was so often talking about things that were outside of my area of expertise. I have an economics background, but behavioral economics like this is different than what we were taught at Harvard 30 years, almost 30 years now. At the time, this stuff was kind of heresy. Now it's probably taught because it's considered so mainstream and one of the founders of modern behavioral economics, he won a Nobel Prize in economics. So people accept that a lot more, but I didn't come from that. I had to learn all this stuff as an adult and I'm, I'm fine doing that. I like learning things, but there's a lower level of confidence for me about learning something on the fly in my 30s and 40s and then trying to turn around and teach other people about that. And that's why I spent more time in the weeds of, like I said, of academic literature, um, reading more you know, psychology and economics papers skimming more accurately skimming them. They're really long and the print is really tiny. Anyway, but doing a lot of that because it's like, I, I have to, you know, I, I'm, I wasn't trying to win a Pulitzer Prize, but I didn't want anyone to say, well, that book, he, he just didn't do his homework, right? He just didn't research that. No one was going to get me on, on failing to do the work required to get the material right. If they were gonna get me, it was because maybe I wasn't clear, or maybe I didn't go into enough depth on certain topics, or maybe I misapplied one concept to one example. But damn it, I was going to get the research right. That's great, that's a great philosophy right there. You know, you went over some really interesting stuff in that response, and you talked about some writings that have stuck out to you. You know, that's some authors that have stuck out to you and inspired you to, you know, really get, you know, the detail in your book. Who has, what's, you know, specific people that have you know helped you throughout your career you know maybe it's mm -hmm. a family member who has, has been um first person i always mention uh tony lacava was a uh, is still a vice president with the toronto blue jays he joined about a year after i did he really took me under his wing 
in terms of starting to teach me about the scouting side and kind of the rhythm of baseball. It never worked in an environment like that before. And that was a big cultural shift for me coming from, you know, kind of fancy pants colleges um, where, you know, everyone sort of had this, had a similar, you know, we didn't all look the same necessarily, but a lot of people come from kind of similar backgrounds, at least in terms of schooling and education focus and career goals. And you get into baseball and you have much more diversity. We have lots of people, obviously, who never went to college because they turned pro right out of high school, or maybe they signed at 16 in the Dominican Republic and they play. And sometimes they, when their playing careers are over, they become coaches or scouts or executives. And so I had to really um, learn to fit in with a very different, still diverse in a different way, group of people not diverse in terms of gender, although that's marginally improving right now. But it, it, it was a different environment for me. And again, there was this whole language of scouting. I just didn't understand. And Tony and other people, Tommy Tanis, who's now a VP with the Mets, those guys were really influential and would you know, tell me, hey, come to this game with us. Hey, we're in your area. Come see this player. And so I would just go do that. And I could ask them ridiculous questions about players and, and they would answer them. So that was always extremely helpful. Um, Dan Kaufman is... Uh, was my boss at ESPN for nine years and is now actually my boss on the org chart at The Athletic. He's not somebody I talk to regularly, but he is above me in the hierarchy. And he was always really good in terms of, uh, especially recognizing work-life balance is importance for me. Um, I have a daughter. Uh, I am now divorced and with a new partner and balancing home needs and my desire to just be home and maximize time, especially with my daughter while she was growing up and she's still growing up. I don't think she's getting taller, but she's still growing up. Getting that as much as possible was always extremely important to me. One major reason I was willing to go to the athletic was knowing this person who had been really good and understanding of me for all those years was now here at the athletic. So if situations came up again where I needed to rebalance my schedule, um, I'd have the opportunity to do so. Um, yeah. I will say also the, the person I work with right now, Emma Spam, is a longtime friend of mine. She is now my primary editor. We've only been actually working together for four months, but we've been friends for a decade or more. And I've worked with a lot of good editors over the years. She's really fantastic. And just the ease with which we can discuss topics or I can ask her often trivial questions about, hey, I'm doing this article. What if I take this slant instead of this slant? Like she's so good and easy about it it is like I'm talking to someone I've worked with for 10 years. And you couldn't ask for more than that as an editor. I tend to, I really try to, I always want to send to editors something that if they didn't edit it at all, they could probably just hit publish and it would be fine. It would be clean copy, they call it. Of course, there's mistakes. There's going to be little typos, but my copy is generally pretty good. But part of how it gets there is also having those conversations beforehand with an editor. It's like, let me make sure I'm giving you what you expect. I don't want to send you an article and you look and say, that's not what I thought you were going to send me. That has happened one time in my career with an editor I've never worked for before. And I was, and still am mortified about the entire thing. It's like I whiffed. And even though the editor probably bears some responsibility for not being clear enough with the assignment, I take it on myself. I whiffed. I don't want to ever have that happen again, especially not at my day job. That's great. So, I mean, that's some great stuff you went over right there. 22 year old fresh out of college wants to be a baseball writer. What do you tell him? Uh, it's tough. This is a very tough industry to get into. Um, the, and you know, there aren't as many jobs as there used to be. I would try to find something fairly local to start. Uh, you know, even if you're not necessarily covering baseball, maybe you're going to cover multiple sports. Maybe you're going to cover local high schools or colleges somewhere. Um, getting the writing experience is absolutely the most important thing first and learning the rhythms of maybe covering a team. If you want to be a beat writer or something like the athletics beat writers aren't we're not doing game stories. I'm not one of them, but they don't do game stories. They do stories. They do features on a regular basis, but they do follow a team around so that they're constantly in touch with what's going on and able to write these longer pieces. That requires, and I don't know that I could just jump in and do that because I've never done, I've never followed a team around as a writer for a season. Not once. I did it a bit with the Blue Jays where I'd go to most home games and then like New York and Boston and maybe sometimes Baltimore. So I'd go to like 80 and 90 games a year, which is still fewer games than a beat writer would go to. So learning that, learning the responsibilities of hitting a deadline, of dealing with a word count, especially if you're still writing for a traditional paper that's printed on, on paper paper and that restricts how much you can write, 
that's a thing. Showing that you can do that, you can deliver. They say we need 500 words max, that you can deliver what you were expected to deliver in 500 words that answers the question and is interesting and is in on time. That's a thing. That is absolutely a thing. And I think a lot of places like that, if you feel like you can write more, they often will let you write more, whether it's on something that's just online or let you keep out a blog, keep a blog or something else for yourself where you can do additional writing, by all means do that. Because you wanna be able to write as much as possible, but writing as a job is different than writing for its own sake. So understanding how to work with editors, how to meet deadlines, and how to, again, have that understand that rhythm of following any team in any sport. Those are important things to be able to show so that you can then be prepared for whatever the next job is. When you see that there's an opening somewhere to cover a baseball team at any level, you'd be able to say, look, yeah, I haven't written about baseball, but let me tell you all the things I can do for you. I can meet a deadline. I can work with an editor. I can work within word counts. I can really write. And I know what it's like to go into a clubhouse and have to ask athletes or coaches or other personnel questions about the game they just played or even something broader, for example. You'll have a portfolio and you'll have these demonstrated skills, which is something I think really helps in any job. It, no matter what the field is, no matter what the job is, it is not a question of do you want the job, but it's a question of can you give the employer what they're looking for? And showing someone that you can demonstrate responsibility and accuracy and timeliness is huge. You will beat out every candidate who's never done those sorts of things. That is fantastic. You went over a lot of great stuff right there. And I think that's a great place to end it. I mean, I feel like I learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. The sun came out today. We're born again.